Hi everyone, welcome to uh, the panel on Taking Cuisines Across Continents is the name of the panel. You guys, are you prepared for that? Do you know what this is about? Uh, I'm hoping you do. Uh, so the other Mike told me he doesn't believe in introductions, so I did not prepare any. So I hope you've read up on these two. We have Mike and Misha, but maybe uh, by way of introduction, you guys could tell us a little bit about where you're from. I, I think the interesting thing here, we're going to talk about travel, we're going to talk about the effect of travel on when, when food crosses continents, when chefs uh, travel around and, and come back to their, their hometowns or, or bring a cuisine that, they, that they're close to and love to a, a, a new place. Uh, but maybe talk about the, the food that you represent. So Misha, we were talking earlier about how there's, you're based in, in Lima, but you, uh, the restaurant is essentially Nikkei, food which is a Japanese-Peruvian uh, fusion, uh, which is an odd word maybe. But talk about talk about the place of Nikkei cuisine. Talk about how uh, I think what's interesting that connects both uh, Israeli cuisine and Peruvian cuisine is that there's there's not one homogenous monolithic cuisine. That they're both uh, very much melting pots. So uh, Misha, introduce yourself. Introduce Nikkei cuisine and talk forever about Peruvian cuisine. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, together with, uh, with Mike uh, and in Philadelphia. I, have a, I, I came here 15 years ago. Um, I went to, to college here in the U.S. in Providence, uh, John Snow Wales. So uh, I've been here uh, for four years. Um, well, and we're going to get to that maybe later uh, in the story in Japan. But uh, what we do is uh, my, my, my family, my father is from Japan, from Osaka. My mother is, uh, is Nikkei. And actually, I'm going to explain the word Nikkei afterwards because actually Nikkei uh, is a word that is uh, used usually for uh, Japanese immigrants outside of Japan, uh, second, third, and fourth generation. Um, and then, after, uh, 20 years ago, this, this terminology or this word was associated to cuisine. Um, basically, what we do is we, uh, we just grab this, this Nikkei culture that uh, was initiated in Peru uh, almost 120 years ago by the Japanese immigrants uh, uh, that, that came uh, uh, in a boat in a big ship called Sakura Maru and uh, to work in sugarcane farms and in cotton farms. Uh, well, in so around what year was that? Uh, eight, uh, 1899. And they were brought on as workers all literally on one, yes. one ship? Yes, 797 Japanese came in that ship. Wow, and were there no follow-up ships? That was it was one ship, and it that was the first one. It, okay, okay, because there was an agreement with the governments of Peru and Japan after the Industrial Revolution. Uh, many farmers uh, didn't have jobs, and Peru has been a farming country for instance since six thousand or seven thousand years ago. So uh, Peru, it was Peru needed labor, and uh, and Japanese came to work. Uh, the idea was for them to stay two years and uh, go back to Japan. But they all stayed in Peru. Mostly for two reasons. Either they did, did it too, too well or too bad. <laughs> so uh, they, they did have... Uh, <laughs> the, the ones that did very well, they stayed in Peru. Uh, they uh, had families. That's where the melting pot starts, you know, by marrying uh, Peruvians. Uh, and uh, it's, instead of marrying uh, or forming families between each other, they started to, to, to blend into the Peruvian society. And that is why this phenomenon or, 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 or this cuisine started to develop so much. Uh, they didn't start to make Japanese cuisine at that time, as many people think, because we're talking about the early 1900s. Uh, uh, people didn't know in Peru about Japanese cuisine. We didn't find Japanese ingredients. Um, most of them were because of the Chinese that came before the Japanese already were working on that. But it was very hard for Peruvians to, to eat Japanese food. So they started doing Creole. Peruvian uh, uh, cuisine with their uh, seasonings, with their uh, way of seeing the cuisine, and that's where, where it all started. And uh, well, that is almost uh, well 120 years ago. And now, what has happened is that basically throughout the the years, this cuisine has been developing. And uh, and now Nikkei cuisine, uh, it was baptized. The name comes from a from a mistake actually. Uh, Many, many, many good things in life can come from mistakes, huh? if you analyze that. And that, that's very, very, very interesting because 
the story of why Nikkei Cuisine is called Nikkei Cuisine, uh, why are these two words put together, uh, it's because there is a very uh, important chef in Peru which is called Humberto Sato. He, was, he is one of the pioneers of, of Nikkei Cuisine. Uh, Japanese as well as Italians, uh, Italian Peruvians, uh, introduced many of the seafood and the fish that we eat in Peru right now. Uh, before that, in the capital city in Lima, only uh, sea bass and uh, sea bass and sea bass <laughs> considered. Okay, nothing else. Uh, all that, and, and Peru has, Lima is one of the, the, the few capitals, of, or maybe the only one that is right next to the ocean. And uh, as we always say, we have always had, even though we have the ocean right next to us, we always have given like the back to the ocean and thought about other ingredients, but not of what we have right next to us, which is a privilege. So Italians and Japanese introduced many ingredients, and for Peruvians, it's so funny to see that maybe even octopus at that time was something so weird for people, and I have stories that of, of, of uh, 50, 60 years ago, not that long, where, where Japanese and Italians went to the beach to to take the octopus, you know, from from, from the rocks, and uh, and uh, people in, in, in Lima said, you know, why are you picking at that up? You know, it's uh, it looks gross, and uh, <laughs> it's amazing. And now everybody eats octopus. So <laughs> now, you, now you have piranha on your menu. Yeah, it's on change. Now we have everything, but I mean, and to make the story short, basically, it's uh, it's it, it's what happened, and uh, the word Nikkei. Uh, the, the first interview in Peru for uh, uh, there is a poet and a journalist uh, uh, who is uh, very well known. He was in France for for for, for 20 years, and uh, he came back to Peru and he did the first uh, interview for a chef. That was something that had never been done before in Peru, and uh, it was in uh, in in a newspaper called La Republica. So while he was interviewing the, the chef, Humberto Sato, he said so, he, he told his story, how he started cooking. He, he was already doing Nike cuisine. For Peruvians, he was doing his cuisine, he was doing Peruvian cuisine. Ceviche and tiraditos and all these preparations with, with some soy sauce, with some ginger, but nobody said, okay, this cuisine is Nike. So when he, when he said, I am Nikkei, second generation Nikkei. He was writing everything up, and when he publishes, he makes a mistake. And he says, instead of saying that Humberto Sato was Nikkei, he says his cuisine is Nikkei. So Humberto Sato uh, gets really mad, and uh, he, he, he calls him and he says, hey, I didn't say that, you know, I said I was Nikkei. I'm not saying I, I do Nikkei cuisine. And he said, uh, no, that, that is not true. I'm going to go through my notes. And he goes through his, you know, through, his, through, his, through his notes. He realizes that he made a mistake. He said, I'm so sorry, but it's already published. You know, there's nothing I can do about it now. <laughs> and, uh, and from there, uh, Nikkei Cuisine uh, had, has an end. So, so Nikkei was how, you, how people self-identified as Japanese Peruvians. It just didn't extend Anywhere to in the world. Cuisine. Not, not only in Peru. Ah, okay. Nikkei's are, you know, it's it's any it's diaspora, it, it, Japanese diaspora, or Japanese, Japanese, uh, American, uh, okay. Peruvian, Brazilian, anyway. So don't trust journalists. For number one. <laughs> so, so, so no, but that, that's great. You know, if, if, if it wasn't for him, uh, I mean, we would have never had like a real Nikkei cuisine. Uh, codified in yeah, way. codified. Yes. Well, I want to come back and talk about certain dishes that you do at the restaurant and how they represent that that path, but Mike, maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, the, the sort of umbrella idea of modern Israeli cuisine, your your connection to it, and how you brought it to Philadelphia. Okay. This is what happens when you don't have a script. You're like, Mike, talk about yourself for the next 20 minutes. Yes, yeah, no, that was my plan, clearly. Uh, this is, most of this book is empty. It just says, <laughs> and Mike's there's a stick the figure market. in there, yeah. and there's a figure of what looks like me. I know what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. I, know, I know you know what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, I do you know have what the what word travel here, so that, that oh, can be perfect. just... Oh, <laughs> perfect. 
I have the names of both of your restaurants. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, so we can, we've got enough to respond. Well, there's going to be a Q&A at some point. You spelled our first names correctly. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> Actually, I did. I did Misha's phonetically, so I didn't mess it up. So sorry. <laughs> uh, so thank you guys so much for having me, first of all. This is great. I'm like proud of Philadelphia at this moment. I mean, this well, you know, yesterday. Yeah, right? I think that we uh, have been working really hard, you know, and I feel like the last couple of years have been really awesome, and it's nice to have people coming to Philadelphia um, to talk about food and to celebrate. So, yeah, so Israeli cuisine is a lot of things, right? Uh, I think that people have been saying modern Israeli cuisine, and what's funny is that, um, and we realized this actually when we were prepping for our dinner, because Jeff was like, yeah, we'll put together some of our signature dishes. Um, we just need like um, liquid nitrogen, the circulator. And it was like, oh, shit, I threw all those things out when we opened the hub. And it wasn't right, it wasn't when we first opened. We had all that when we opened. But as we um, started to get comfortable with what our role was in, uh, in, in cooking Israeli cuisine, I was like, we can't have a circulator here. I want charcoal, we want wood, I want like a bunch of different spices that nobody can pronounce. I want to represent the hundred different cultures that make up you know, Israel, modern day Israel. I want to talk about like Shabbat dinners, I want to talk about breaking Ramadan, I want, it to, I want all these things like happening in one place. And for me, the technology actually was, was diluting it. So we had to get rid of all those things. Um, we have them for dinner on tomorrow night, so we'll be okay, not to worry. Um, I know as my, my chef de cuisine is like literally freezing his hands right now, trying to figure out like what nature do. The learning curve should be more than one day. <laughs> uh, but I think that the idea of globalizing, I think the idea of Israeli cuisine becoming um, global is what makes it modern. Uh, because I think that that that, like I said, the, you can't have. Israeli food without charcoal and without like the lamb fat burning over the charcoal and the natural fire and the, the lamb fat and the za'atar falling on top of the tchina on the lava and standing up at two o'clock in the morning outside of a club and eating it. Like that is what Israeli cuisine is. And, and I think that um, what is happening now is people are realizing that it is this sort of mishmash and, and this tapestry of um, of like humanity that's kind of ending up on these dishes all over the place. And, and that is what um, we didn't intend on doing. When we first opened Zahav, we wanted to, to open an Israeli restaurant. And what we were doing was copy pasting dishes from Israel right. and bringing them to the US, which sounds good in theory. But like I would, ha I would get in these arguments with customers about like my shakshuka, which I think is very good. But it will not compete with like Dr. Shakshuka because I'm not an actual doctor like him, but also because you're not overlooking the Mediterranean Sea and because you're not in the old city of Yafo, you know, that's been around for like 5,000 years and because it doesn't matter how good or how imported the tomatoes that we get, when you're eating them in February in Pennsylvania, they just don't fucking taste good, you know? It just doesn't taste right. So like, so, uh, so getting in these sort of debates on what was relevant or not, um, <coughs> was a big indicator. We had to almost close, right? Because, and, because the hummus be, wasn't right? Because <laughs> it was like, because people, or because the hummus wasn't right. No, I made the hummus right. I made it every day. The hummus is great. But what we weren't doing was accepting our role as this conduit. We weren't, we weren't sort of passing the torch, and we weren't looking at Israel as a whole. We were taking these little bits and putting it together, not, not being comfortable being like chefs, and saying, well, you know, I remember actually, it was an awful, awful first year, and we were like basically going under, and my partner Steve and I were like not taking paychecks, and we were like a week away from basically shutting off the lights, and I had to call my dad and ask him for money to make payroll, which was not good. Uh, but what it did was actually freed us for a few months, because what we said was, well, we have nothing else to lose, let's just cook. And I remember we put this... Balkan style macaron. My family is from Bulgaria originally, so like the idea of the Balkans and the Ottoman influence is 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 very cool, and that's sort of a story for a different time. But I was we were taking mackerel and curing it, air curing it um, with a little bit of salt, and we're serving it with scallions and like a little feta cheese and olives, and it's very very nice. 
you know, it's a great dish, but like it's not what you would expect coming into our restaurant. It's not what you would expect. Too, too dainty, or was too sort of removed you know from yeah, I guess Israeli so. context somehow? No, it's like, I think it was. I think it's all those things, but like I don't need, you know, to me, our customers deserve more and they expect more from coming into our restaurant. And I'm not, as much as I behave this way, I'm not an Israeli grandmother. You know, and I'm also not, I haven't been doing the same dish. I haven't been feeding generations of my family from the same dish for years and years. So like, of course, I can make things as accurate as humanly possible, but the context in which you will receive it from me is not the same as and, it should be. Right. right, and accuracy and authenticity is this sort of ever receding target that, that just leads to some very fraught conversations, but they're good to have. And you, I mean, fighting about what is and isn't Israeli cuisine is, is the most Israeli thing you could do. Right? I mean, just, is, uh, uh, disagreeing by someone coming in and, and spitting in your face and saying, this is bullshit, it's, they're That's celebrating the, they are. It's the a tradition. It's yeah. a term of endearment telling me that it's up. No, I mean, the whole thing I mean, about Israel, Yisrael means to fight with God. It's like a big conflict, and that is it, and it's like fighting and arguing all the time. But we're also talking about food. And you find these things right now, the, the hot topic is to say whether Israeli cuisine exists or not, or if that's Israeli or not, but like everybody fights about that all the time. That is the nature of food. There were no lemons in the Middle East until the Moors brought them only a little while ago. And before that, the sour came from sumac, which is the same sour that our Pennsylvania Dutch have been making pink lemonade with for hundreds of years. So pick any dish and fight about it by all means. I mean, I think that's one of the, the pleasures of, of going to Israel and going to Peru is that when you, you, you show up, I've had a chance to go for stories, and people ask, you know, how, how long do you have? And, and they'll fill that time with, you know, in Peru, it's Italian, Spanish, African, pre-Inca, you've got the food of the Andes, you've got the food of the coast, you've got, you know, just there's no one Peruvian food, just as there's no one Israeli food. So it makes that, you're never going to solve that question but it makes it a much more interesting uh, conversation. Well, I know particularly over like 30 cups of coffee and vodka. <laughs> did you ever have, did you, when you were in Israel, did anyone say, come have a cup of coffee with me? Uh, not in their homes. Sorry. Should I be offended? No, because usually what happens is you sit down and it's like trays of pastries yeah, and like yeah, bowls yeah. of couscous yeah. and whatever. But, um, so I, so, yeah. So here's the thing. So like we almost closed. I had this Balkan mackerel dish, and I was like, this is very good. This is something my grandparents would be proud of. And Steve, my business partner, is like, dude, you need to cook, and you need to be a chef. And you need to take all these things that, uh, that inspire you and, and make dishes out of them and put it together. And I think that the idea of taking the Yemenite, the Bulgarian, the Moroccan, the Greek, the Ethiopian, and, and, and being able to tell a story is what is, is driving. It's this sort of velocity for Israeli cuisine today. Maybe. Uh, so you guys are doing a collaborative dinner uh, tomorrow. We are. Uh, Misha, could you, I don't know, is there a dish that you're doing or a dish that you have on, on the menu at, uh, at Mida that, that sort of represents this trajectory, this, this path of Japanese coming to Peru, Peru Jap Japanifying the Peruvian food, but also you were telling me that there are certain dishes that are Peruvifying, whatever the word is, uh, like Italian cuisine. And, and these, an interesting sort of melting pot dish that, that is on the menu these days. Well, uh, actually, the nitrogen is for a, for a ceviche, for what I make. And uh, it's very interesting because what I was hearing, what, what Mike was saying is, it's, it's the same story for, for me. Uh, the moment you said that uh, you were almost one week away from closing the restaurant and uh, you had to call your father or your dad to, to ask him, for Mike to pay the, the payroll, I did the same thing. Uh, you called uh, Mike's dad? <laughs> yeah. you, I have to get his number. Yeah, yeah. Is, yeah he uh, was thick, dude, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and it was uh, three years after the opening of the restaurant, actually. It was not like as soon as we opened, because when we just opened, we had like a good year, and then everything didn't work. I don't know why. Maybe it's because uh, what we were doing at that moment, uh, knowing that Nikkei cuisine was a cuisine that, we, well, that was, that is part of Peruvian cuisine, but nobody, even even though it had a name, and, and, and by the way, uh, the journal is named, and the poet, which is a poet also in, also in Ostrosa, if you want to check it out. Um, 
nobody understood what we were doing. What we were doing, because uh, we were not Japanese in a way. People were coming for sushi, uh, and uh, I was working more than working on sushi. I was working on on how to bring the best of the local ingredients from Peru and give them give them uh, this identity uh, with Japanese techniques. But uh, it was hard for people to understand what we were doing at that moment. So. So we, we, we did like, I don't know, maybe for lunch, five covers, for dinner, ten covers. I mean, you know, that's, that's impossible to, to stay in a restaurant over the time. So, uh, and, and really, my father said, okay, I'm doing, this, this is going to be the one and only time I let you money, so uh, there you go, uh, what are you going to pay me? Okay, and I said, as, as soon as I have the money, I'll pay you. And um, that's the way it worked. Uh, we were struggling for, for actually total maybe maybe the restaurant has eight years now and uh, we're struggling for four four and a half so more than 50 percent of the time we're open what, uh, what was the change did you change your your style of cooking or did you change the I, way I didn't you change anything I, I just kept on doing what what I thought it was it was right I I, I always say you know what I thought this food is good it's tasty uh, I mean I think that I think the the public the people change rather rather than, than uh, people people uh, in, in Peru and, and also the the, the evolution of, of Peru in the in the culinary map of the world also help a lot. Uh, uh, our customers were more willing to 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 just sit down and, and, and let us bring them the food rather than ordering from the menu some things and uh, that that happened to everybody not only to my lot to, to every Peruvian restaurant that goes creative in a way, you know, uh, this is surprised me. Okay, so so that's when it started, and uh, and I think from from there we took it, uh, and going back to the dish, uh, basically this there are two dishes that I would like to talk about, but one is the one we're going to present tomorrow. Um, it's a ceviche, uh, which of course has a has a Spanish influence because. Uh, in Peru, we had fish, of course, fish, fish, seafood, and chilies or ajíes, but we didn't have the lime. Okay, and uh, that comes from the Middle East, of course, and uh, and, and comes through this, with the Spanish to, to, to Peru. And that is something very important to talk about because without lime, we wouldn't have ceviche. And ceviche is our flagship or our our, our most important uh, preparation or dish. So that is, there is a connection. Um, and it has a lot of Japanese also because of the odumami that we take from the kombu and katsubushi. And then we freeze that, all, all that stuff. And there's also always a reason for, for using, in this case, if we use technology for that dish or we use liquid nitrogen, um, it's because I believe that ceviche, uh, I always used to put, not me only, but many people when they make ceviche, they, they throw ice in the, or they make a, 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 a fish stock or a dashi, and they would, they would throw it to the preparation while they are blending everything, because it's very nice to have a very, very, very cold ceviche. You know? And if you're at the, at the beach, it's better, even, even better. So uh, they say, okay, so why don't we freeze this? We make it a powder, and we have an extra cold ceviche. And uh, that's what we're gonna make tomorrow. But one of the dishes that I, I, I really, I think that it has many influences is one that it's a tiradito, which is, tiradito means, uh, Tira, tirar is to throw, but when you say tiradito, it's like saying it with a with a special uh, uh, love to the to the preparation. It's to, to, to put like a like a carpaccio, like to put the thin slices of the fish on a plate. And uh, in the north of Peru, they have ceviche with sarandajas. Sarandajas uh, are some beans, which for me they give a very nice texture. Our chickpeas in Peru are not good. Okay. Uh, so they are really hard. It's hard to make a little hummus uh, in, 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 in Peru. But, uh, but, <laughs> but uh, we have these beans which are amazing. And uh, we make a, we make a cream, a puree with, with, with olive oil, with, with garlic, and we put it at the bottom of the ceviche. We put the fish on top, we use mackerel, and the, and the leche de tigre. So, so I think, and, and, the, and the sensation is, is incredible because you have the creaminess, of the sarandaja cream, and you have the fish, and you have the citrus of the lime, and I think that that dish brings together. Uh, but it's a hummus-like 
puree that, that you have at the moment? Yes. Yeah, yeah you've got. Yeah. And describe what, for people who don't, describe Leche de Tigre. Leche de Tigre basically is one of our mother sauces. If we, if we, if we talk about, uh, I don't know, in the world, you know, the tomato sauce, bechamel, all, 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 all the meat sauces, for us, it's Leche de Tigre. I mean, it's not very European, but for, for Peru, we would use, it's basically lime juice, uh, ajíes or chilies, garlic, uh, ginger, and whatever else you want to put. But it, 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 has, it has to have the essence of the fish also. So, leche de tigre, why is it called leche de tigre? If, if, if some people don't know, it's because many years ago, uh, when, when people thought that ceviche, that, that the lime cooked the fish, which is actually not true because we cook with, with heat, with fire, uh, they left the fish almost 12 or 24 hours until it became white. And all the remaining juices uh, of, uh, of, of the fish, of the onions, of the cilantro, of, 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 of the ajíes, uh, they sold it also in a, in a cup. Beside the ceviche, you could, you have, a, you could have a cup of, uh, of leche de tigre, which it turned white because of the time. And you just have a shot of that. Um, they say... I was going to say, I wish I known that before I sent my chef to the zoo to go milk a tiger. <laughs> <laughs> like, you don't come back without a quarter. Is he okay? Thaw out your fingers and get over there. He's still better off if I got out of with the uh, liquid nitrogen. Yeah, I hope it's okay. Um, <laughs> it's also long again. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, and, and I was going to explain why it's called, why is he called my tiger's milk. We always say that seafood is aphrodisiac, um, and um, well, usually uh, they say after a hangover or, or, or in order to, to get strong, you had, had to have leche de tigre, so so give you the strength. That, that that's why it's called like that, you know. And it's, it's why that that's the reason for the name. So we use that for everything. Be before it was used only for ceviche, but now we know that it's like. It's, it's like a mother stock that you can throw to rices, to any preparations, and you would just give it a nice punch, uh, and let's kick, uh, kick, it up, kick up the flavor for, for any preparation. Um, I want to turn it over for questions soon, but Mike, is there a dish that you're doing with this dinner, or something you have on the menu that shows that progression, that once you guys did start changing the way you, you cooked, and just sort of cooked your own way, is there a dish that, that sort of brings America into the equation? Well, I mean, I think in general we had to adjust. That was the big change. It was like we can't just we we have to we have to interpret. It. Well, yeah, and it just, that's not the way that food works. Right. Not again, historically, it just doesn't. But for this dinner, we're super excited. We are going to do um, hummus with uh, fried cauliflower, but we're taking fermented cauliflower leaves and tossing them with uh, date molasses, which is a very Israeli thing, um, and actually a little bit of soy. And one of the um, the fried corn that you put on top of the ceviche? Cancha. Cancha, we're gonna put cancha on top of that. And then um, we're doing lamb loin uh, ceviche. And we took cured lamb and made almond, like almond milk with it. So we're gonna put the almond, which is to mimic leche de zebra, we're gonna put that on top of cured lamb carpaccio. And then we're doing like kibanaya, which is like a, a Lebanese or Druze or Galilean raw lamb dish with that, with like anchovies. Um, and then, we took veal loin and we uh, dry aged it for 30 days with basterma spice, which is like the, the 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 mother of like pastrami or brizala actually. And we slow roasted it and we took ayi amarillo and uh, which is like a yellow chili uh, that's used a lot. And we uh, blend that with tina and it actually looks like amba, which is the mango pickle. So. I don't know. We got. Hopefully, this show will taste good. I think it will. <laughs> <laughs> why, why was I not invited to this dinner? I don't know, dude. I mean, you should come. It's going to be sick. We're going to have a really good time. So, uh -oh, and, and and yeah, provided that my sous chefs are still alive. <laughs> if you're using tigers and freezing their hands, it's going to be. Yeah. If you're using Peruvian ingredients, it's going to taste good. Huh? Yeah, it's really good. We actually, one of our sous chefs, Eddie Fisher, is um, uh, Bolivian, and he. I've had to like use a high pressure hose to keep him away from the dinner, but he's gonna he's gonna be there as well, and, and it's gonna be special. And I think that like we talk about food waste and we talk about progression, and the, the deal is the history of that, all of this it goes back to I don't know. Everything comes from Spain, or everything comes from North Africa, and it's just really I think fascinating and sort of spiritual to be part of this.
this. I mean, uh, Israeli food and Peruvian food are, are evolving in real time right now, and we're right. sort of doing it tomorrow night. So you better not miss it. <laughs> uh, did anyone have any questions for these guys? Yeah. Um, looking through my own prison, I travel a lot for work. And it took a lot of trips going back and forth to Italy to kind of mitigate that effect of sitting at the Mediterranean and eating something and convincing yourself that it's better and becoming more cynical and actually and more objective. Um, do, you, do you, to the extent that authenticity is important, do you feel like you have to detach yourself sometimes from the sensations that are created by the place and just kind of focus on the food when you're thinking about flavor profiles? Or do you kind of just discount that? I'm sorry, so discount the authenticity? Or no, discount, discount the effect that the location and like just being in, the, in a certain mood in a certain place and as on the way your bought your taste buds taste food. Yeah, I mean it's hard because like we are talking about the most subjective thing in the world, you know? And um, I think to me context is everything. Like there are dishes that I have made that I've eaten that were my grandmother's, that I have her recipes kind of know what we're doing when it comes to food, they will never taste as good as like when they were being done. And the same thing if you travel, and uh, Italy is so, it's such a romantic, beautiful, sort of gastronomically rich country. Uh, it's really difficult to, um, you, you want to evoke those things when you serve them to other people, but you can't mimic them. You, you're not going to be able to get the same sensation. So I think it's always this weird balance between um, authenticity, your context, the guest context, and like what you want to achieve with it. Because at the end of the day, you just want people to be happy, right? And you want to give them new memories, but you want them to be able to, you know, it's the relationship between the old and the new, and, and that sort of stimuli that gets people excited about food. So you can only do, you can only do your job in it, and I think you have to throw away the rest. You know? I think it's impossible to recreate. Uh, I think Peru is a, maybe the perfect example for that. Uh, I mean, octopus is of course one ingredient, that one, one, one product that we use all over the world now. But uh, as, as Mike said, uh, Israeli and Peruvian cuisine uh, are evolving as we talk, as every cuisine in the world. But the difference is that maybe uh, Peru, uh, I talk about Peru because I'm Peruvian, um, there's so much to discover yet because we haven't been uh, uh, foraging the way we should for so many years. Every trip we make, at least about, we would, the, the, this uh, conference about travel also. So we discover something new. Every, every trip we make, we come back with some new ingredient. Uh, and people don't even know what it is, and later on you find it in the markets. So that, that is very, very interesting to see how, how five years ago, not even ten, five years ago, nobody ate quinoa. Huh? Quinoa, I had twice quinoa coming, come, coming, coming to Philadelphia on the plane also. So it's incredible <laughs> to see how quinoa has become one superfood in the world. Peruvians didn't eat quinoa, even though quinoa is, is from Peru, Bolivia, you know, this, uh, from the Andes. Um, it was seen as... People from Lima were saying, why should I eat queen quinoa? No? Give me, I don't know, any, 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 anything else. Which you, I don't want to eat quinoa, I don't want to eat kiwicha, I don't want to eat local products. I want to eat, eat Italian, I want to eat Japanese, I want to eat anything that comes from abroad. And that is what stuck our cuisine for a while. You know? uh, and, uh, and now we, we, are, we are working on so many things that, that you say, for example, I just... Uh, one month ago, uh, I don't know if you heard about Macambo. Macambo, uh, it's a it's a theobroma. It's a family of the cocoa, of the cacao. And uh, five years ago, also because everything has changed so much in five or six years ago, uh, was was garbage. I mean, 
uh, it's a tree that grows, it gives shadow to the cocoa trees. And uh, there were so many uh, of these fruits which are, which are amazing. Everything can, is edible, from the skin to the seeds. Everything is edible, and it's amazing. Uh, and they just let it stay there until, until it became fossilized and became like rocks. And I didn't have a value. Nobody wanted to eat that, and people, everybody, like the natives, ate, uh, eat uh, macambo, but uh, they didn't nobody else to see them eating it because it was a symbol of poverty. Because nobody, it, was, it didn't have a value. Today, there is an there is an industry developing for the seeds of this fruit, and uh, and also for the pulp, for ice creams, for for for. for for many other preparations, and I mean, we are seeing how this product is evolving every time. And like that, there are so many ingredients uh, that we find every day w w where a market is created for this product because it's amazing. And uh, you see that in the markets. Five years ago, you find now you find maybe 400 percent more more supply of products of different products from all over the country than you you, you used to find five years ago. And I hope this comes to a thousand percent more in the next five more years. So uh, that is something that helps not, 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 not only the chefs, but helps the people. It helps the, the farmers, helps the fishermen, helps all the all, all, all the society, all the all the regions of Peru that have been forgotten for so many years and uh, uh, gives them uh, lets them have a better quality of life also. So I think that is important. Yeah, well, that's funny, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think as it comes to America, it's a little bit hard to identify what what constitutes also American cuisine and what comes back. I mean, I think that sort of heritage cooking is just coming back in general. I mean, people care about the wheat that they get. We use a mill that's very close to here, and you know, God forbid, we should only do refined flour. That would be like against our ethos, you know. So I think that like old cooking traditions are coming back, and I think that that's just kind of the way it goes. I got into this discussion yesterday with uh, another chef who was making permante. Put the <laughs> gum in it to stabilize it. And I was like, well, you know, and, and we were talking about when the French Laundry Cookbook came out. I'm deviating a little bit from your actual question, but I don't care. <laughs> I, can learn, I can do whatever I want. Um, when French Laundry Cookbook came out, um, every single restaurant that you would work in had 10 pounds of permante. And it was like, you only use water, salt, and butter. And before that, we would take cream, we would like make a wine reduction, and then cream reduction, and then you'd throw in your butter. But then the moment French Laundry came out, it was like, you could never do that, you know? And I was like, whatever happened to like the cream sauce? And then it occurred to the chef and I, he's a sous chef at Squirrel in LA, that the dish that both of us, that, that, that was the spark for us to start cooking professionally was Alfredo sauce. We made like fettuccine. I made it once in Israel at a cafe, and it was like sauteing the butter with the garlic and the white wine, and reducing that to sec, and then adding the cream, reducing it by half, and Parmesan and butter off the heat, and I'm also buying it with like the pasta and the starch and the pasta water, and then a little bit of mace. That's the key, mace in the end, or a little bit of nutmeg at the end. And I was like, and that dish literally was the reason I started cooking. And I was like, why don't people use? Alfredo's, why don't people use cream reductions anymore? And I'm like, you know what? In one freaking year, somebody's gonna open a restaurant that has like toast and like cream sauces, and they're gonna kill it. And cream is gonna be back in. <laughs> Maybe not in Peru, but like, you know. You know what they'll do here? They'll get cream on quinoa. And they'll, they'll just, yeah. So, but I, I think it's a beautiful thing because the trends and what is so non-chic is right back in season a year or two later. And I think that, um, especially, you know, this, America's pretty young, you know, so for us to have these, like, revolving doors of things that are interesting or not are pretty cool. We do it our best. Do you? Wind down, one step in. So good. Butter. There it is. Go to his restaurant. <laughs> it's called Alfredo's. It's on there. <laughs> <laughs> I know we're supposed to be doing audience questions, but uh, Misha, I just want, you were telling me uh, before we sat down that uh, about the sort of, the Incan, uh, we have this idea that food labs and, and, and sort of uh, aggressively sort of trying out new things in cuisine is, is a very modern uh, new thing, but you're telling me that essentially there are pre Incan uh, food laboratories that, that exist. Uh, to just quickly describe those. Uh, okay. uh, well, we were talking about Morai. Morai is in Cusco. 
you can Google it, you will see the shape of it. It's basically um, terraces that are in a different height. So what the Incas did, because they had an empire that when not only it was Peru, it was many countries, you know, uh, from South America, they brought seeds from, from, from many different uh, places. And uh, of course, altitude is important. And uh, they, they would plant every seed in every different altitude. And uh, they would realize which worked the best for, for each of their crops. So uh, they were already doing that. And as, as I said, everything is cyclical in a way. You know, uh, things that, 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 that work, in, like, like the cream that he was talking about, uh, or any other ingredient that, that, or, or preparation or technique. We're talking about, for example, lyophilization. You know, we have all these technology now that you can lyophilize. Li 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 I don't, I don't know if I'm saying that right in English, but uh, but uh, which is cold and dr drying with, uh, with, uh, with coal, uh, dehydrating with coal, uh, any product. Uh, the the pre Incas were already, already doing that by nature. They were they, when they when they would have a good amount of potatoes uh, in their harvest, uh, a surplus, uh, knowing that maybe the next year wouldn't be as good as that year. They would try because of the weather is very dry and cold. Uh, the, the potatoes would, would end up like, like like rocks, white rocks, and they would sort them. They were free, freeze drying <laughs> yes. potatoes several thousand years ago. That's right. So uh, you see that, and that is, that is something you make now because you think it's interesting, it's different. Oh, of course, it's, uh, it, it brings some flavors and everything, but uh, they were already doing that. So there are so many techniques that come from thousands of years ago. That right now are are being used in the in the in the art cuisines everywhere in the world. That you say, oh, this is contemporary, creative, uh, avant-garde, whatever. It's not. Has been there forever, you know. And you just bring it up and and use it to make food taste good, which is more important. Mm -hmm. Flavor is it's all about flavor. All right. So from uh, Alfredo sauce to pre Incan freeze dried potato <laughs> powder, uh, there's a lot to learn from. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Thank you guys. Good luck with the dinner tomorrow.